Uh, we're in the book of uh, Romans. We've been in Romans for a while. Uh, it's been fun uh, studying. Uh, chapters 9 through 11, uh, Paul stops and talks to the Jews uh, about what he's been talking about uh, because they had a lot of questions uh, because he was talking about salvation by faith uh, and they were not used to a discussion like that. They, they thought you had to get saved by faith plus perpetual obedience to the Torah uh, and to tradition. And so Paul's uh, been answering their questions. We're going to look at question number seven that they would pose to Paul as he wrote this letter. Uh, but before we look at that, we must understand the context of chapter 11. Uh, it begins in chapter 10, his discussion uh, about salvation, uh, which we talked about uh, before I left on my Shabbat, my sabbatical that I took for June. Um, but you must confess the Lord, as, as Jesus as the Lord, the deity, as God, the Messiah, to be saved. Uh, and when you get to verse 21, he, he, he makes a statement that would have may not bother you too much, but if you were a Jewish person, it'd be one of those questions that would arise in your mind is, what in the world does that mean? Have you ever read the Bible and you come to a verse that just kind of stops you in your tracks, makes you take a deep gulp, and you're like, ooh, I don't know about that. Has it happened to you? You read your Bible? Four people read their Bible, yeah. So it happens. You know, it happens to me. I, like, I'll read a verse, and it's kind of, oh, that's kind of unsettling. I didn't think about that. Uh, that, that would be verse uh, 21 of chapter 10, which we talked about last week. Uh, here was what Paul said. But as for Israel, he, God, says, all the day long I have outstretched my hands to a, what kind of people? Disobedient. And then he throws in obstinate. Perhaps you have children. Everybody that tells me, and my wife and I always smile. We've been married almost 40 years now. I mean, when anybody says, we, we, our marriage is kind of in trouble. We're going to have children just to kind of bring it together. <laughs> I've heard that one too many times. It's like, uh, could we talk? Um, because you might get a disobedient and obstinate child. And God says, when I think about my people Israel, those are the two words that come to mind. And if you don't believe that's true, just read the Old Testament. Uh, because all throughout the Old Testament, the majority shook their fist in God's face, and the minority embraced him in faith. And Paul says, uh, let's talk about uh, salvation and, and God's work among the Jews. Uh, God says, all day long I've tried to get your attention, and you've pushed back at me. So because of that, I've gone to the goyim, to the Gentiles. Uh, but does that mean, as a Jew would nat naturally ask, if you're going after the Gentile, does that mean you actually, you've actually forgotten the Jew? I mean, God made his original covenants with us. Does that mean the covenants are like void? Has God finished with us? This could be a short sermon. If you look at verse one, it's not gonna be. Uh, it's, but there's much to talk about when you look at Paul's answer to the Jews. Because this is question number seven that a Jew would wanna know. Is God done with Israel? Because you're saying we're saved by faith in the Messiah. So no more Torah? And we don't have to obey the Torah to get saved? I mean, no more traditions, etc. Paul's going to give it an answer in verse 1. Uh, and he's going to tell them in, in his answer, uh, and this is why it should be a very short sermon, because uh, he's going to tell them nothing, nothing thwarts God's redemptive and his retributive plan for Israel. Nothing. Not even their sin. Uh, God's kingdom program is always on track. Uh, the book of Isaiah uh, is a very interesting book. I took a class in that uh, from the professor uh, ended up mentoring me all through college. Uh, great, great man of God. Um, spoke 16 languages, uh, got his degree in Old Testament from Brandeis. Very educated man, Dr. John Hartley. Um, loved Isaiah. I love chapter 49. Because uh, when you get to chapter 49, after you read about the sin of Israel, um, like in chapter 28 of Isaiah, uh, you see this from God. What does God say to Israel that's about to go into Babylonian captivity? Uh, but Zion said, the Jews said, the Lord, ah, he's forsaken me. And the Lord, he's forgotten me. Uh, what does God say in response to the Jews who had that as a, as a statement prior to captivity? What does he say to them? Can a woman forget her nursing child? What say you to the rhetorical question? Any women here? There's, any women here that have children? Can you forget your baby after you bear the baby, right? No, no. It's food time, boom, you, you, your body's designed. Can a woman forget her nursing child? Answer, no. Can a woman have no compassion on the son of her womb? I mean, can you go and have that child and never show compassion on that son throughout his entire life? No, he said it's impossible. Then God says, even these may forget, but I will not forget you. He's speaking to the Israelites, to the Jews. Because of their sin, he's going to judge them with Babylonian captivity. And their argument is, he's forgotten us if that happens. He says, no, I haven't forgotten you. 
He says, behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God says in anthropomorphic language, because he's spirit. If I had hands, and if I looked at them, what's written on them? Reading from right to left, because it's Hebrew, right? Not, I'm just saying. A couple times ago when I was in Israel taking people on an archaeology tour, we went across a little muddy river, um, well, at kind of where the, the Jordan River starts. We're walking through the boonies in the forest, and the little crab walked across us out of the mud, and he was walking from right to left. And I'm like, even the crabs walk right to left. It's a Jewish crab. And just saying, it's back to my sermon. God says, if I, if I had hands and you looked at my hands, what would you see? Yisrael. Your name's on my hand. Yisrael. I can't even have a conversation with a cherub class of an angel or a seraphim. And, uh, and I'm, oh, Israel. And by the way, you need to go to this plant. Oh, Israel. He said, I, your name's continually before me. How can I forget you? So is it possible for God to have forgotten Israel? No. Because of their sin? No. No. See, what God promises you, he will, he will make good on. And this applies to a goy or a Gentile too. What God promises you through the salvation of Christ, he's not going to ever renege on that. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So Paul's going to validate his point that God, nothing's going to thwart God's plan for Israel uh, as that nation is concerned. But he wants the Jews to understand two things. Number one, that God cleanses the minority within the cultus of Israel, within the nation of Israel. At no time in history was he looking at the entire redemption of the country. I mean, I'm talking every single Jew saved because they have a free will. What does man do with his free will? Well, <laughs> some of them embrace God on God's terms and the majority well, they shake their fist on God's face. So he says, let me under, let's talk about this from a Jewish perspective, Paul says. Has God forgotten Israel? No, is what he's going to say. Verse 1. It says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? That's the statement of the Jew. And, and Paul says in, in definitive format, in the, in the Greek text he does, he says, may it never be. Exclamation point. May it never be. Um, if you um, want to learn some Greek, this would be what you'd want to learn as a parent if you have children. Because may it never be is the strongest way to say no way that it never happened in Greek. Uh, my dear daughter, love her to death. I bought her a car. It was almost brand new, Honda Civic. Within short order, she had wrecked it twice. Yeah, and she didn't get hurt. But I mean, the, the second wreck was $8,600 damage to an almost brand new car. You know, after a while, if you get them, after you get it fixed and they come to you for the car keys, oh yeah, no problem. After a while, it's like, me genoito. <laughs> no way is that ever happening in time and space. That's what Paul says. Has, that's why I said this should be a short sermon. Has, has God forgotten Israel? His answer is, me gunoito. See, you say this with me? Me gunoito. Yeah, you use that next time you have a car situation with a child. Paul says that, that just absolutely can't happen. God can't forget them. Why? They're engraved on his hands. Now, there's a lot of people in our world today who think God has forgotten Israel, right? I mean, Islamic teaching, what does it teach? I mean, I've read through the Quran. What does it teach? Well, that, you know, the Jews are evil, corrupt people, and they've abandoned God. Because they've abandoned God, they've rewritten their scriptures to make them the preeminent one, not Ishmael. And they're, they're the sinful people, and they wrote out Muhammad coming and all that kind of stuff. They're really God's people, not the Jews, etc., etc. And if we just get them off the world scene, there's shalom, peace. That's not what God said. What did he say? Your name, Israel, is always before me. My, your name. God's always going after cleansing the minority, not the majority, because majority rejects him. So let's look at verses 1 to 7, Paul's argument here about God working through the minority, where he doesn't forget Israel. Paul says, and it's really kind of an interesting argument. A child can understand it. He says uh, in verse 2, uh, God has not rejected his people whom he nor foreknew. And prior to that, he said, uh, for I too am an Israelite. Uh, he said, I was a descendant of Abraham. I'm, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And God foreknew me. So if God foreknew me and I didn't have to do works to get saved, and I'm a Jew and he saved me, I'm a living illustration that God loves uh, Israel. Because I got saved. post crossed. What tribe is he from? Benjamin. Benjamin. Who's his forefather? Abraham. Abraham. He's, that's his father. He said, I'm a Jew, but I'm saved. So I'm living in an illustration that God loves Israel. Uh, tribe of Benjamin. I love that tribe. How many tribes were there? There were 12. This was the left-handed tribe. Right? You know this? 
Uh, when you study the Old Testament, you understand that the tribe of Benjamin, they were left-handed. Uh, they loved them. Uh, any left-handers here? Praise God for you. Yeah, I'm left-handed. Darren's left-handed, etc. cetera. Uh, there's not many of us, <laughs> you know? Uh, why would they use a left-handed person in the Old Testament? Well, when you study fort, fort, fortification structure, which I teach when I go to Israel uh, with people, uh, when they build a, a, a fortification, it's not a gate that you just attack straight on. They would build a wall and a gate, and then they would build a complex outside the gate, and then the gate was on the side. What for? Uh, most people are right-handed. What hand is your shield in? This is a military church. You should totally know this. Don't you still use shields? Uh, <laughs> your shield, if you're right-handed, is in which hand? Left hand, okay? So if you're attacking a wall with archers, and the wall is right in front of you, but the door's to the left, what do you have to do with your body? You have to turn to the left. Your shield is in your left hand. Your sword is in your right. You're exposed to the archers. You just met God. You died. So what's up with the people from Benjamin? Well, they're left-handed. <laughs> What's their shield in? Right hand. They, when they turn to attack the gate, they, can, they, can ex, they don't expose themselves. Plus, they were the slingshot guys who could pick off people off the wall with their slingshots as they swung them and guided themselves with a the shield. He said, I'm a Benjamite. I'm left-handed. Praise God. God hasn't rejected us. I'm from the tribe. He saved me. You mean he's not in the business of still saving people? But he didn't save the entire nation. He saved those in the nation who came to him. Paul says, I'm an example. And Paul says, if that's not good enough for you, he said, if you go back to the, 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 the Old Testament and you read, he said, you're going to find a story about Elijah, which tells you clearly that God was always working through the minority within the nation. I mean, pay attention to history in the Old Testament. So he's going to say here in uh, verses 2 through 6, he says, do you not know what the scripture says through the passage about Elijah? And the answer is, well, of course we know the story. Uh, how he pleads with God against Israel. Uh, and what, is, what did Elijah say? Well, Lord, they, your people, they've killed your prophets. Uh, they have torn down your altars and I alone am left. Translated, I'm the last Jew. It's over. They kill me. There are no more Jewish people. And they're seeking my life, namely Jezebel. She's hunting me down, Lord. Uh, but what, what was the divine response to him, Paul says? Uh, God says to him in 1 Kings chapter 19, when he's hiding in the cave, 150 miles south of where he took on the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, overlooking the valley of Armageddon, when he took on the 180, uh, 850 prophets of Baal of Jezebel, uh, after that huge victory, he then flees for his life because she's thinking, I do not like a godly voice in a godless environment. If I just eliminate him, there's no more Jewish prophets. It's golden. God comes to him in the cave and tells him, oh, you think you're the last Jew? No, you're not. What's he tell him? He tells him, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000. You don't know about them. Do you talk to your television and you watch political news stories? What say you? Do you talk to the television? You don't talk, you don't turn the television on because you're totally spiritual? Um, <laughs> I talk to my television. It, it like really frustrates me. Or websites. I'm like, what are they thinking? Where's logical Aristotelian sense? Where's common sense? This defies the laws of logic. I mean, and if you, if you get rid of this absolute, then everything goes. I mean, I'm constantly just like, I feel like Elijah. And sometimes, don't you, when you're talking to your television, think to yourself, it's over. I'm the last godly man standing. You ever feel like that? It's just unbelievable. And you're not. You're never alone. Why, what's God whispering to you in your cave? You're not alone because I've got 7,000. I've got 70,000. I've got 7 million people who love me, who follow me. You're not alone. And God says, you know, I wasn't about the whole, the nation wasn't going to come to me, but there were always those within the nation like Elijah who loved me, followed me, worshiped me. Uh, I was uh, into cleansing them. That's the true nation of Israel. Those people. Elijah, Elijah, what a man of God. Verse five, Paul says, in the same way, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it's by grace, salvation, then it's no longer on the basis of works, i.e. observance of the Torah. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Translated in simple terms, if I can get saved based upon obedience to the Torah, the Ten Commandments, and the 613 extra commandments, and obedience to the, the traditions, you know, 
etc. If I, if I can get saved that way, then salvation is not by grace. But if salvation is by grace, it's the work of Christ in my behalf. I can't do anything for it. Paul says, any Jew or Gentile who understands salvation is the grace of God that sent his son to die for you and rose again the third day. Any Jew who understands that is saved. And that's the true Israel. And Paul says, it's, it's no longer by works. It's no longer by works. God was always working to cleanse the small nucleus when inside the nation. That has been his plan all along. And we'll talk more about the salvation of the nation when we get to chapter 11, verse 25. But that'll take a couple of weeks. What's new? Um, so has God cast off his people? Answer is? No. You remember the Greek word? Oh, excellent. Meganoito. Yes. No way. No way God has done that. Uh, God is not finished with Israel. So what does that mean to me as a Gentile? I'm a, I'm a Gentile. I'm a goy. Uh, all of us collectively are goyim. What's that mean to us? Uh, if God has them inscribed on his hand, we're now members of the church, the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, but he's not done with them in his kingdom program, uh, then I should be concerned about them as a people. Should I not? Absolutely, I should. And we are as a church of, re of reaching out with the gospel of Christ to God's original chosen people, according to Deuteronomy 7, the Jew, of bringing them the gospel of Christ. Also, this tells us uh, that our sin does not trump our standing in Christ. That's what it tells us. Your sin doesn't trump your standing in Christ. I had somebody uh, talk to me after one of the services uh, last week, and they said to me privately, does this particular sin mean God's done with me? And he named the sin. And I said, if you have a dad, and you sin against your dad, and you go to your dad and you say, because I've done this heinous sin, is your dad going to be able to tell you you're not my son? It's impossible. He could say it, but he can't t change who you are. You're always his son. So I said, if you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, he's cleansed you. You're saved by grace. Now go out and live a holy life unto God's glory. And, and do not listen to the voice of the devil whispering in your ear that God's done with you. He's not done with you. That's what he's telling Israel. I'm not done with you. Remember Romans chapter 8? We were there several months ago, maybe a year or two ago. Remember Romans 8 when we went through it? You know, what shall uh, separate us from the, you know, the, the love of Christ? What does Paul say? He says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, it's a word in Greek for angelic beings, uh, nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, once you're his child, separates you from the love of Christ. But that doesn't mean you can go live like at whatever you want to as a child of God because he's holy. But he, he will always love you. And that's what he's telling the Jews. I've always loved you as my people, but I've called them to salvation. But only the minority is re responding to me. Isn't this what Jesus said in his first sermon on the Sermon on the Mount? This is what he said uh, when he was teaching there on the north shore of the Sea of the Galilee on a beautiful hill in a natural amphitheater. I take people there. It's, it's a totally gorgeous place. Bougainvillea is growing everywhere. Roses. Hear the little birds in the trees. It's a go gorgeous. And you can hear the wind blowing through the tall grass. And Jesus said there at Matthew 7, the, the path to destruction is wide. Everyone is on that. The path to life, narrow. Few find it. See, that was the minority within Israel that came to God on God's terms. He was always about cleansing that minority. He's still working that way today. The majority pushes us back against the gospel, even in our day and age. And it's the, it's the majority does. The minority is the one who says, Lord, I hear you softly, tenderly calling my voice. And you come to him. God uh, finishes this uh, passage out with Paul's second argument to validate the fact that God's not done with Israel. To move beyond the fact that God uh, cleanses the minority, now he's going to tell them that I need to caution the majority. See, in, in wrath, God always remembers mercy. So he's not going to judge you in eternity because of your sin and rejection of him without warning you, you need to come to him in faith. He always does this. So when you get to verse 7, Paul says this, what then? What was Israel seeking that it has not obtained? But those who were seeking, is implied, uh, they, the chosen, they obtained it. And the rest, they were hardened. Paul says that, think about this for just a minute. He said, take note and be warned about our history. He says, when you think about the Jewish nation historically from the giving of the Torah forward, what were they seeking? They were seeking salvation by faith in God, Elohim, Yahweh, and works. 
that those two things combined, they believed if I observe the, the, the laws, the Ten Commandments enough, and if I obey those 613 other Mosaic Commandments, and I make sure that at my house we understand uh, Passover and all, the Feast of Tabernacles, and we observe all these things, then it, those religious works will garner favor with God, and we will be saved one day. But Paul says, what was Israel seeking? What were they seeking? Salvation based on faith in God plus religious works. Paul says they didn't obtain righteousness that way. Why? Because you can't get saved that way. That's Paul's argument in the book of Romans. He says, but those who were chosen, they obtained it. I mean, the ones that God decreed, you will follow me. When they came to him in faith, they were saved, but they got the righteousness of Christ, uh, which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, that in Christ, we have his righteousness. You can't manufacture your own righteousness. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, of many of these in Israel, and this is kind of looking down, uh, so it's kind of an odd angle because I didn't want to walk down into that water. Can't imagine why. Uh, that water is just water that's been sitting there forever, so I don't even know what's growing in it. But uh, this is at the, uh, when I take people to Israel, we go to the so southern wall, which is where the steps to the temple uh, to go worship God back in the day of Christ. Uh, and there were these uh, ritual baths. They're called mikvahs. Uh, they're all over the place. And so you would want to get cleansed uh, as a worshiper of your sin. So you, you would, uh, one line would walk down into the water, you would submerge yourself, and then you would come out of the water, and then you were spiritually cleansed. Did that water cleanse you? Did it wash away sin? No, no. It's just a traditional ritualistic thing that you did. And Paul says, uh, you, you, Israel sought righteousness by things like that, but it didn't save them. Now, here's another illustration of a picture I took as I was uh, on the Temple Mount one day with my tour group, last time I was there, heard all this music and drummers drumming and festive people singing. It was awesome. I'm like, what in the world? Uh, and uh, these cars were pulling up and multiple people were coming out and this little tent structure like a hoopah is, is raised and they're walking with a young boy under there. Uh, this is his bar mitzvah. So I followed him with my camera, took tons of pictures. Hope I didn't bother him, but I'm click, click, click. This is awesome. And they go all the way over to the wailing wall and uh, there's a fence up there that divides the men from the women and the young men go behind the fence and huge Torah scrolls and it's, it's bar mitzvah day. You have to watch this thing and think, this is awesome to behold. But for that young man to get bar mitzvah, did that save him? No. It's a religious work. But Paul says it, that kind of pursuit does not save. It doesn't, you can't obtain salvation that way. Why? Because you are sinful and there's no amount of works you could do to cover all of your sin. Uh, Paul has this argument in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, here's how he puts it. For as many are that are under the curse of the law are, uh, are under it, are, uh, as many are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. So to be accepted in God's sight, you must perform all of the law. But the problem was the 10th commandment's a really hard one to obey. What is the 10th commandment? We do test here at our church. What, what is it? You shall not covet. You shall not covet. That's internal. That's internal. Because you can say, hey, I got the other nine down. No idols at my house, etc." You get to the last one, internal. All, your, all that has to happen is your neighbor gets a brand new sports car. And you're a car guy. And you're looking over there going, you got to have me one of those. What have you just done? You're not even going to talk now. Now you're quiet. You sinned. <laughs> I got to have me one of those. No, no, no. You start coveting. You start coveting. And so you can't, you can't get saved based upon your performance because you're sinful and you're always going to do something that shows you're sinful. And so Paul's that's Paul's argument. It says now in, uh, in Galatians 3, now, um, now that we know that no one is justified by the law before God, it's evident. He says the righteous man shall live by not works, but by faith. However, the law is not a faith. On the contrary, he who practices them, the law, shall live by them. You want to get saved that way? Give it a good shot. He said, I used to do it. Doesn't work. He said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. See, Jesus fulfilled the law. Why? He obeyed all the Ten Commandments, externally and internally. He obeyed the other 16 and 13 commandments. He never sinned because he's God in the flesh. He bore your sin. Paul says, you must come to him in faith to be saved. The Jews tried to get to God based on their works, and they're not saved. But the minority are cleansed 
when they come to God on God's terms. So Paul says, if you don't follow God on God's terms to come to him in faith, what happens by definition? Well, he just said in that verse, the rest were hardened. The majority were hardened. This is a scary thing. Um, from playing sports when I was growing up, uh, I was a baseball player and I also wrestled in high school some, um, but when you play baseball, uh, you get lots of calluses. And I played since I was a little kid. So you get a lot of calluses on your hands. I remember the first blisters I had on the inside of my hands from batting practice. I mean, the whole inside of my hand from hitting hundreds of balls. I mean, all the time. Uh, I remember how bad that hurt. Thinking, why would people want to play baseball? And then after a while, they went away. They're still there. I'm 61 years old. They're, those blisters are still there because I still use my hands like that. But, but I can't feel. You could stick pins into my hands. And I think we had a picture of this. Did he already show the picture? Are they listening to me? Yeah. There's an angel somewhere who listens. and See the calluses? Yeah. He said that's like sin. When you reject God's gospel, his terms, you, you get blistered and it forms a callus. And as you reject God's gospel, it forms a callus. And you continually reject God's gospel. Spirit's still calling you softly and tenderly, come to me. You get to where you can't hear him because your sin of pushing back against God has totally callous your heart and your mind to him. That's not a good place to be. Uh, is that you? See, that was the Jews, Paul said. You have pushed back against God so many times, you're not even listening to him anymore. Verse eight, Paul says, just that it is written, He's quoting here from uh, Isaiah chapter 29. God gave them, the Jews, a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 29. You have to understand the context of Isaiah chapter 29 because you have to go back to chapter 28 of the book of Isaiah where Paul says to the Jews prior to the Babylonian captivity, God's going to judge you because your politicians, well, they're corrupt and your priests are corrupt and they don't teach truth anymore. Read chapter 28 where they didn't like the voice of the true prophet anymore so they sought to extinguish it. And then when you get to chapter 29 God says because you have pushed back against the voice of the prophets for hundreds and hundreds of years I'm going to give you eyes that can see but cannot perceive spiritual truth. And you're going to have ears who can hear things but you won't understand the spiritual truth of the prophet when it comes to you. This is a form of judgment. Is still uh, applicable today. The more you push back against the gospel of Christ, the callus is formed over the heart. God can penetrate the callus, but it can get to the point where it's very difficult for you to hear him. You can see and not understand what you're seeing here, but not understand what you're hearing. What in the world was Marty talking about for 30 minutes today? Never go home think that? No, never, right? Verse 9, he said that David even warns us. He quoted him from Psalm 69, a messianic psalm. It says, uh, let their table, the table of those who push back against God, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened and see not and bend their backs forever. Under the weight of their sin is the implication. He says, uh, what, what should happen to those who constantly shake their fist in God's face? Well, eventually it gets to the point where he says, that which they think shall uh, save them one day, their religious works, will be that which judges them. That it will be a shock to them. Let, let it become back of them. Have you ever set a trap and you triggered it as you set it? Have you done this? Or you don't set traps? Do you know how many chipmunks are in Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, and I'm a turf guy. And they like to dig holes. It just drives me insane. Because you get one chipmunk, you've got 30. Am I right? Now, don't start getting all compassionate on me and stuff, okay? I can just see it now. Oh, they're so cute. Yeah, they're cute, all right. They are digging machines. But anyway, I set in a trap the other day, and I put some peanuts in it, and I slid it underneath a spot where I knew they would kind of frequent, and as I'm sliding it under there, I triggered that thing. Scared me to death. <laughs> and I even knew what I was doing. So peanuts flew everywhere. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's chipmunks are probably laughing at me, so I <laughs> got the trap, put some more peanuts in it, slid it back under there. Bam! We went off again. I'm like, I got a, I got a doctorate, and I can't even set a trap. <laughs> I eventually got it underneath there. But the trap was becoming my trap, was it not? And he says, if you're following God, you believe in God, but you think you're going to get into his presence because you're a good person, you do good works, that, that what you're pursuing is going to be the trap for you spiritually. It will judge you one day. Close with a story uh, about uh, a Jew uh, in Israel. Uh, his name is Zvi. 
uh, I think he was a Holocaust survivor, uh, he came to know Messiah, the Messiah, one day as Savior and Lord uh, and became a, became a very ardent, uh, devout disciple of Christ uh, and shares his faith constantly uh, in the nation. One day, some uh, Hasidic uh, Jewish boys from a, a local uh, yeshiva, uh, their particular school, came to his door. And they knocked on his door, and he opened his door, this old man. Uh, and he said, hey, welcome, you know, book or tov, good day. What can I do for you? And they said, um, uh, we are here checking mezuzahs to make sure they're kosher. Huh? Okay, first of all, the first question is, what's a... What's well, a mezuzah? Okay, so the mezuzah, that's a mezuzah, mezuzah, not medusa, uh, mezuzah, uh, that's something else. Um, so Shaddai is what it says, the God's name, El Shaddai. Uh, and it, it, the mezuzah is put up on the door, and it's based on Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema of Israel. So behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Echad, he's one, he's mighty. But anyway, so you put the mezuzah on the door, and if you kiss it as you come in, and you pay homage to it, this is earning points with God. Really? Really. So they came to his door and they said, we want to know, is your mezuzah kosher? So his first question to them is, I would like to know from you boys, how do you know if a, if a, if a mezuzah is kosher or not? And they, they're looking quizzically at each other. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It's just what they told us to do. So he said, I have a question for you. He said, God is no mo- so much concerned with uh, whether a mezuzah on a door is kosher. God is more concerned that your heart is kosher. Woo. That's totally different. And then he had a very interesting discussion with these two young men about the Messiah, Jesus, to tell them only he makes your heart right with God. Do you know him? Well, they were going to have no part of that. They said, we got to go back to the yeshiva and get two rabbis to come talk to you. So they did. They got two rabbis. They came loaded for bear. Two Hasidic Jewish young men and two Hasidic type rabbis who study the Torah 24-7. So they came back to Zvi's house and had a discussion with him. And he presented Christ to them. And they left angry and would not embrace the Messiah. But they had a choice, did they not? So based on what we said last week, now that they know who the Messiah is, based on Zvi telling them as a Jew who the Messiah is, as we said last week, they're without excuse. They've heard the gospel. But God reaches out to the minority within the nation and says, I call you to myself. Softly and tenderly, I call you. Will you come to me? When you come to him, he saves you whether Jew or Gentile, really. But the majority, what do they do? I will have no part of that. Which are you? Are you one who pushes back against God's gospel? It's, a, oh, it's illogical, it's erroneous, it's historically unverifiable. All the arguments you've mustered, but God's talking to your heart saying, no, I'm calling your name. He cleanses those who come to him in faith. Uh, my, my prayer is for you to come to him and know him. There's no greater thing for your life, for your marriage, for raising kids, then walk in with the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Let's pray. God, thank you just for the power of the cross to save and redeem sinners. Doesn't matter the nationality, Jew or Gentile, you died for all of us. Thank you for Paul's passion for his people and thank you for your love and your commitment to your people. And might we move uh, out in our community with the gospel of Christ that redeems and saves. And for those in our lives that we know that don't know you, might you truly softly and tenderly call their name until they come home to you in faith in Christ's name. Amen.